Well, it's beautiful with spacious skies, has amber waves of green, and has purple mountains majestic that rise up out of the plains. And all across America, from sea to shining sea, where the mountains and the prairies meet, is the place I need to be. Home is where Montana is, Montana is my home. From mountain peaks to prairie lands, the places I have known. And I'm bound to ramble. Hello, welcome to the Backroads of Montana. I'm your host, William Marcus. This is the third installment of Backroads, a show that allows us to visit out-of-the-way places in Montana and meet the interesting people who live there. Today, the back roads are snowy and cold, so we came inside for some hot chocolate and a warm fire. We're at the Double Arrow Lodge near Seely Lake. The lodge was built in the 1930s by a banker from Holland, and it's operated today as a resort lodge. Many of you will be seeing this program during the holiday season, a time of tradition, communion, and reflection with family and friends. With that in mind, we have a story about a town from Montana's pioneer past. We'll hear the story of families who roamed this state thousands of years ago. We'll meet a couple who spend 11 months of the year getting ready for Christmas, and we'll take a real Montana sleigh ride. But our first story is from tiny Polaris, Montana, about 45 miles northwest of Dillon. The town boasts a post office, two homes, and one business that is literally the spirit of the community. A person has to look hard to find Polaris, Montana. Not a lot of folks are up to the challenge. Apparently not even the highway department. After a day on gravel roads and some rush hour traffic, we drove into downtown Polaris, population two. The last thing we expected to find was a cold beer, something to cut the afternoon's road dust but getting one was as easy as blowing the horn. This is Walt Melcher, half the population of this southwest Montana town. Walt spent most of his 85 years in the saddle, working ranches from Plentywood to Columbus, breaking horses in Weibo, shipping horses to Minneapolis on steam trains, and even trying his hand at dry land farming until the Dust Bowl of the 30s eventually blew him to this valley. Right now, Walt is proprietor of the only spot in town, the Polar Bar. Well, it's a meeting place. People come here, they've been coming. There's ranchers that live here that like to come here and visit. A lot of them come here and talk over business and stuff, their deal, you know. The history of this saloon is almost as distinguished as Walt's. The Mahogany Bar was built in Salt Lake City in 1860 and shipped to Montana by ox team. For years, it was the main fixture at Skinner Saloon in Bannock, Montana's territorial capital. Ranchers, prospectors, trappers, businessmen, and desperados all stepped up to the polished brass rail for liquid refreshment. Skinner's was the favorite hangout of Sheriff Henry Plummer. Although sworn to uphold the law, Sheriff Plummer and his band of road agents robbed and murdered hundreds of citizens throughout the territory. The bar was three years old when time ran out for Henry Plummer and his nefarious gang. The original structure was borrowed from the old Polaris silver mine. It used to be the miner's washroom. Walt's father-in-law purchased it in 1941, furnished it with the bar from Bannock, and founded the Polar Bar. That's what it put down here in the first place for. That's what our daddy liked to play cards. There's a poker table. We used to play poker, have poker games. You could really lose money if you got in the game. Men working on the ranch, they'd come here Saturday night, and play till Monday morning. They had some good games. Them, them times are gone forever. After a year of successful operation, the saloon, which sat on a small hill, had to be relocated. Well, because the guys get drunk and fall off the hill. <laughs> you don't believe that. The Polar Bar is distinguished by being a self-service establishment. Until a few years ago, the building was never locked. If Walt wasn't around, customers simply helped themselves to five varieties of liquor or two choices of beer and left their money on the counter. 
These days, there's a bit more security. But once comfortably seated, Walt is still eager to hand over bartending duties to his customers. I don't like to get off of these stools. See, when you're 85 years old, you've got to save your legs. <clears throat> Use your head. Helping out around the saloon comes naturally to Walt's neighbors. Joyce, Bob, Jerry, and a dozen more pitch in behind the cooler, chop firewood, and help maintain the old log boarding house where Walt and his wife Helen live. It's just kind of a community thing, and uh, I think that brings people together, just helping the old folks out. And, but they are great people. And he knows how to have a good time, too. Every year, Walt throws a party for a dozen women from Butte. They rent a cabin in the valley and literally commandeer the polar bar for one evening. They think it's nice. They can do as they damn please. Sing and holler, whistle, and then bring their own music. They have a good time. They get together, get away from their husbands. At the polar bar, tall tales are held in high regard. Many center around Boots, an army canine, who supposedly lost a foreleg during the war. Got his leg shot off stealing chickens. He told everybody he was a war dog, he was getting a pension for it. They all believed it, too. <laughs> you don't believe that, either. I know you don't, the way you're looking. There's a dollar that was pinned to a wall by one towering customer. He put it there while standing flat-footed. Walt describes him as being as long as a hair rope and just about as limber. To date, no one comes close to removing his calling card. Almost everyone agrees on the Polar Bar's most memorable evening. We had an indoor hockey tournament here. <laughs> we crashed up a beer can and we had a couple of brooms and we put uh, cornstarch on the floor and then we led the, somebody led the horse in. Somebody rode a horse in the door here. We had fun. But there's always someone who wants to spoil the fun. In 1983, it was the state health department. The polar bar has no running water, and when asked about the bathroom facilities, Walt simply points to the back door and the thousands of acres beyond. Most guests favor the willow tree just outside. Unable to overlook these violations, the health department threatened to close the polar bar. 2,000 thirsty people arrived to protest the action. The beer truck came out with five barrels of beer, and Claire had 50 cases here, and he thought he'd have beer for all summer. I come here about 4 o'clock, wanted to get a beer and didn't have any. It sold out. The bar switched to disposable paper cups and dragged in two restrooms from somewhere and remained in business. Don't you believe it? This comes from all of the folk. You think we're planning to see you? Just think of some more funny joke. But in tiny Polaris, Montana, the future is always tenuous. What will become of this rural saloon, which is in fact a community center, where trust is honored, though truth is often stretched? This gold is the finest you've seen, and I thought it come from Ireland, because it painted my finger green. <laughs> where the proprietor sings the songs of his youth, regional tunes that died out with the last of his cowboy friends, songs that still float on the night air in downtown Polaris. But they all called me Ola, just the same. <laughs> That's all I will say. As we mentioned, the mahogany bar at the Polar is from Montana's territorial capital of Bannock, just a few miles down the road. At one time, Bannock boasted a population of more than 3,000 people. There were dozens of businesses, a brewery, even a bowling alley. But Bannock's economy was based on gold, and that played out quickly. When it did, the capital and most of its citizens moved east to Virginia City. Here's a look at what they left behind.
Looking at Bannock today, it's hard to believe how busy the community once was. The town and its inhabitants never took even a Sunday off. One resident described it this way. There was nothing visible to remind a person in the slightest degree that it was Sunday. Every store, saloon, and dance hall was in full blast. Hacks running, auctioneering, mining, and indeed every business is carried on with more zeal than on weekdays. If you or your family would like a glimpse into Montana's pioneer past, try attending the Bannock Day celebration. It's held each July. Activities include a black powder shoot, horse and buggy rides, a church service, and a bounty of pioneer foods, including buffalo steaks. Our next story takes us deep into the prehistory of North America, long before Native Americans developed their distinct tribes and cultures, back almost 10,000 years when nomadic groups of people wandered the Rocky Mountain region. Archaeologists refer to them as hunter-gatherers, and new details of their lives are slowly emerging from a Montana hillside. Uh, when we find features, uh, like I thought maybe I was finding a feature here, we found a lot of features at this site, and it's, it's really great because we know that we can keep going and finding more. If you want to get to know Montana's earliest inhabitants, you have to dig. Today, we're near the Ruby Reservoir, about 15 miles from Virginia City. People are always digging in this area. 100 years ago, they were digging for gold. In 1972, they were digging for garnets. Instead, they found spear and dart points. That led to what this team of archaeologists is digging for today, secrets from Montana's prehistoric past. All we work with is the fragmentary remains. We just work with what was lost and thrown away and things that were forgotten. Uh, this one, of course, uh, stands apart from all of the others that have excavated because of the, of the uh, incredibly rich record of occupation. It was occupied longer by more people, and we have evidence of them doing a wide range of things for which we previously never had evidence. This is Les Davis, professor of anthropology and archaeology at Montana State University. For five summers, he and a group of dedicated students have been excavating an area visited for more than 5,000 years by Montana's first inhabitants. Davis calls them the people of the deer. They were nomadic hunter-gatherers, roaming across vast portions of the Rocky Mountain West. Their journeys followed a distinct pattern. Each fall, they stopped at this gulch to prepare food for the coming winter. For thousands of years, this area was an enormous kitchen. This is one of the uh, food preparation facilities that we've excavated this year. This is the central feature. Uh, it is red around its margins, which shows it was heavily burned. And this is where they prepared the coals. They then would put the coals in these large outer features, such as you see, and then do the roasting and baking of seeds and or meat. And then there are small uh, auxiliary features that occur generally around the outside of them, irregularly. Uh, these we think were post moles. They put some type of, of a vertical upright in them, uh, perhaps willow, perhaps pieces of wood and then perhaps uh, fashion a windbreak or even a complete domed structure so you'd have a kind of a smokehouse since it is a food preparation facility. The valley looks the same today as it did 9,000 years ago when it was a popular stopping place for paleo Indians. Deer, porcupine, mink, and other game were available. So was goosefoot, a favored plant. One of the myths dispelled by Davis's crew is that these early occupants were strictly meat eaters. Evidence indicates that these prehistoric kitchens were built to roast seeds as well as meat. Some plants were even milled into flour. The absence of large animal bones indicates that little was wasted. This is an example of one of the hammer stones that was used down here for slamming against another stone with the deer bone in place and breaking it open so you can free and remove the marrow. The bones were then placed into the cooking areas and the fat and grease rendered. The nutritional value of fat was important for survival in this harsh environment. What these people didn't eat, they often wore, scraping down the hides with stone knives and sewing them together. This 9,000-year-old bone needle comes with a heat-treated tip. These were people who were resourceful, uh, ingenious, 
made very effective use of, of what we would consider scarce resources you know, and lived out their lives in this beautiful country. Davis and his team of researchers are just as resourceful as the people they're studying. Excavation equipment of every variety is at their disposal, right down to a toothbrush for detailed removal. The area is constantly being photographed, mapped, measured, and recorded. Artifacts are laboriously cataloged and treated with consummate care. Soil removed from the site is sifted, washed, and examined for bone and tool fragments. Fine screening guarantees 100% recovery, and at this site has accounted for over 75,000 specimens. Digging in the summer sun is hot, dusty work, but there are a few rewards. Routine breaks help replenish the body's natural coolant. And a full-time cook provides three squares a day. I make anything except for where it needs stiffly beaten egg whites, because I refuse to beat those by hand. There's the friendly camp dog, Buffy, who hopefully isn't chewing on something of archaeological importance. The greatest reward is the bounty of information these anthropologists are unearthing. It's, it's part of our past. Um, I think uh, everybody should have some interest in it and where we've come, come from, and, and it uh, kind of might give us a sense of how we've uh, progressed techno technologically and uh, where we might be going. That philosophy is shared by their instructor. Les Davis believes that even today, we can learn a valuable lesson from the early inhabitants who called this hostile country home. And at times, it's it's violent, difficult country. But we have evidence for 11 and a half thousand years, some 300 generations of hunter-gatherers in Montana found a way to make it work. And some of them were still here when uh, the white man first came. So uh, there's a continuous record of human uh, occupation of uh, most of Montana. And it uh, should give heart to to uh, people who are considering leaving today, probably for all the wrong reasons and will ultimately regret it. These archaeologists have chosen to stay and with trowel in hand, help write a new chapter in Montana's prehistory. Many of the artifacts collected by Les Davis and his team will be displayed in the prehistory section of the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman. Or for more information, you can contact the Sociology Department at Montana State University. Next, we'll take a quick stop near Joliet, a friendly town between Red Lodge and Billings. We'll visit the home of Paul Midland, who gets up each morning with hundreds of hungry mouths to feed. My father bought this place in uh, 1949 and we moved here from Wisconsin. <coughs> and he was in the dairy business. And I was in the dairy business until 1958. Um, he was killed in a tractor accident in 55. been in the Angus business since uh, about 1960, raised Angus cattle. I grew up, of course, milking cows, and uh, in fact, I was the third generation in the dairy business. My father and his father both milked cows. But uh, I just thought I'd like to do something different. It isn't a job that you'll get rich at, but uh, uh, it's a good place to raise a family. You know, a farm is a good place to raise a family. If Danny wasn't here, I guess I'd have to hire somebody to help him. Dad needs some help around here, too. He can't do it all by himself, so I come back. 
help him. It doesn't pay as good as my job, other jobs do, but I guess it's more, more enjoyable. I, I know Danny's always going to be here. You can depend a lot more on family, you know. In 1976, Les and Hanukkah Ipich bought an abandoned schoolhouse and its accompanying teacherage in the Nine Mile area near Missoula and transformed it into their home. Eleven months out of the year, the area resembles Santa's workshop as the Ipiches design and build colorful Christmas ornaments and decorations. Their work, which is more cultural than religious, is sold each year at a special Christmas market held at their home the weekend after Thanksgiving. We visited the market and let Hanukkah Ipich be our guide. The schoolhouse was built by the Anaconda, Anaconda Company for the loggers' families in about 1910. We don't have exact records anymore, but uh, in 1936, most of the logging was done, and it uh, became a the Anaconda Company donated it as a community center to the people around here. So then we bought it in '75, and then we started fixing it because it all all it was was uh, a building with a leaky roof and four walls. The fence we saw in southeast Poland, close to the Czechoslovakian border, and it was around the cemetery, which was a fantastic place, because all the gravestones were, instead of stone, they were very beautiful wood carvings, and there were picnic benches inside, and everybody always came and had lunch, and this fence was around it, so we took a photo of it, and then we built one, just sort of like it. Uh, when my husband retired in uh, 76, then we started this sort of on small scale, we thought, you know, to keep us busy a little bit. This is what happened. <laughs> One of the reasons we do is we like to play, and it's just fun doing them, and doing all the research and trying to create something which people possibly might enjoy. That's all. People like to have nativities, Christmas is brought home to them. That's why they like them, I guess. You know, they can identify better with it than some strange place in Jerusalem or whatever. I think that's it, mostly. On Sunday night, we have uh, all kinds of candles in the windows and we have ice lights uh, lining all the walkways. And in general, very little electricity is being used. It's mostly all candlelight. We did it a lot in Sweden. And there are many, many candles in the windows, so the whole house is sort of lit up and very warm because of all the candles. We also have candles on the Christmas tree. We might not light those Sunday night because there will be so very many people, maybe, and that might be asking for trouble a little bit. Just about a half mile down the road from the Ipich schoolhouse is another interesting place to visit the Nine Mile Ranger Station on the Lolo National Forest. The ranger station has been around for almost 60 years and is on the National Register of Historic Places. It was built by members of the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, in the 1930s. Tucked away in the Bitterroot Valley of western Montana is the home of Bill Crockett and two of his closest friends, Babe and Brenda, two hardy Clydesdale horses. Each year about this time, Bill hitches them up to a sleigh that he constructed and he invites some of his two-legged friends for a Montana sleigh ride. Let's join them.
We hope you enjoyed this edition of Backroads of Montana. We'll be back in early spring with more of the sights, sounds, and people who do make Montana the last best place. If there's some place you'd like us to visit, or an individual you think the rest of us should know about, send a letter to Backroads of Montana, University of Montana, Missoula, Montana, 59812. Share your insights, suggestions, and ideas. I'm William Marcus. See you in the spring. And from the top I can see the world below With the mountain peaks beside me And there's a new birth in the springtime And summer comes alive And there's gathering in autumn Winter's cold and quiet Home is where Montana is Montana is my home From mountain peaks to prairie lands Places I have known And I'm bound to ramble Yes, I'm bound to roam And when I'm in off the road now, boys Montana is my home And it's a land of many waters Coming down from mountains high And there's a mighty big sky up above us here You can hear them coyotes crying and there's plenty of room for moving and plenty of fresh air. And the folks out here have the time of day and a helping hand to share. Home is where Montana is, Montana is my home. From mountain peaks to prairie lands, the places I have known. And I'm bound to ramble. Yes, I'm bound to roam And when I'm in off the road now, boys Montana is my home Coming in off the road now, boys You know I'm heading home